Hello, my name is Catherine Craik and I'm Professor of Early Modern Literature at Oxford Brookes University and I am delighted to welcome to you to this, the first of four book launches to celebrate the inauguration of our new series of books, Beyond Criticism Editions, published with Boiler House Press at the University of East Anglia. Tonight we're celebrating the publication of Macbeth, Macbeth by Ewan Fernie and Simon Palfrey. I'm here as one of the three commissioning editors of Beyond Criticism. Um, and the aim of the series really is to discover new forms for new thinking about literature. We want to foster a literary criticism that is itself literary, speaking to anyone who thinks that reading matters. We want to break down some of the false divisions between scholarship and imagination. And um, really all of our authors in this series um, are interested in how thinking critically is also thinking creatively. To think creatively is to think critically and vice versa. Uh, the series is open to new submissions. So if you have a project that's somewhere on that interesting hybrid uh, frontier between these two ways of thinking, do please get in touch. Um, our, we have a website for the, uh, the series, beyondcriticism.net, and uh, you can purchase all of our four new titles via our, our publishers, Boiler House Press, and I've put the link in the chat. Um, a few quick thank yous before we get underway. Um, I'd like to thank Torch very much indeed for their support um, for this event. Um, and I'd like to thank our publishers, Boiler House Press. Um, as an independent press, it's always an act of love and care, I think, to bring new titles out into the world. And that's certainly been the case in this um, very uh, particular year. So particular thanks then to Nathan Hamilton and to Brad Bigelow for all their help and support. Um, the authors have asked me to convey to you that you're most welcome to ask questions at any point uh, throughout the event, so do please join us in the chat if you would like to do so. And without further ado, I'd like to turn now uh, to a book trailer for Macbeth. Once upon a time, there was a girl called Gru. She didn't know it at the time, but one day she met the King Macbeth. He saved her from soldiers and stroked her and was kind. He was like a father. She woke in pain and saw him moving upon her. Her man behind his shoulder going, shush, shush. That's how her little one came. She was driven to a nunnery and doused with rue, the herb of grace to set you free. There have been many like you, the sister said. Wave upon wave, I know it. Your son, my son, is dead. But the true son lives. Think on his suffering and yours will seem like the blown angels of a dandelion clock. Day after day, she sat alone, trying to forget. Your mother a witch, your daddy a demon. My boy is not healthy, she said. The old castle drew her like adamant. She came across a smiling old porter, kneeling for her hand. My crown. A boy so raw, stripping his skin and laying it in stripes. My realm. Boy of beauty, biting the hawthorn apple, watching her back, drawing her in, drawing her in. Screw your courage to the sticking place. Break open the temple. Look upon the great doom's image. Take the primrose path to the everlasting bonfire. The true sun lives.
Hello and welcome. My name is Michael Whitmore and I'm the director of the Folger Shakespeare Library. I wanna welcome you here today to our reading of Macbeth, 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 as well as a discussion with the authors. Brief introduction of who you will be seeing and hearing. First, Ewan Fernie, who is professor at the Shakespeare Institute, chair of Shakespeare Studies and Fellows, as well as the director of a project called Everything to Everybody. Simon Palfrey, professor of English at Oxford, fellow at Brazenose, uh, and himself working on another project called Demon's Land about the Fairy Queen. I think the best way to enter the project is to simply begin. And so I want to introduce our two authors who will begin reading from their texts. Thank you very much, Mike, and, and thank you, Torch, and, and thank you, Katie. I assume we, we, we can both be, be heard. Um, we're, we're going to read a short section from a long book. You've had a, a sort of sort of fragrant fragrance of it in from the trailer. This particular section picks up um, the story of a character who's apparently peripheral to the action become, but becomes more and more central. He's the one who possesses the, the, that strange thing in Macbeth that pervades the play, that foreknowledge of what's going to happen, a sense that of what the doom is. And he moves through our story, trying to save the characters in our story from um, their destined doom. Okay. So can I be seen? I can't see myself. Yes. I can be seen. <laughs> By me, at least. All right. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to read a section from about um, a third of the way through the book. Um, and just a, a very brief sense of the moment in the, in the story. This character called uh, Sod has been residing in a nunnery um, uh, incognito um, with the attempt to, as it were, save the girl Gru, who was featured in the um, uh, video you've just seen. Um, and it went a bit bad for him in there and he was whipped out. And we pick up the story just after that when he's been whipped out and he's on his own. So we'll start from here. It would be, the reading would go for about 10 minutes and then we're gonna um, talk with Mike about stuff. Okay. So Sod had laid himself to rest in an abject angle of Burnham Wood. His entire being was cloudy and sick. He felt shame like he could hardly remember moving inside like a fat tumor. Had he ever had a soul? If so, its light was going out. He'd seen into Gru's frightened eyes and now he couldn't bear the shame. Only one thing was he sure of, he would not be returning to Ross. Ross was a death dealer, a child of monstrosity, a clairvoyant accessory to terror. He could live better as Sod. Sod at least knew that he was lost and broken and begging for unlikely repair. He wished he could be a buzzard, dozing away on an old rotten stump, a dull and lazy and cowardly raptor. Or perhaps he could shed weight like a suicidal bat, readying for final winter. A couple of finches fluttered about, inspecting him more or less amused before fluttering away again. He could feel his heart inside, rising up and down, up and down, more quickly than he'd wish, all in all, existing was humiliating. The carrion crow appeared on the branch immediately to the right. Sod froze in fear. The crow was eyeing him blackly like a trained cannibal. The crow sidled nearer, sizing up the meat. There's nothing here, mate, nothing. You'd be better off with a worm. <laughs> the crow was so black that Sod almost swooned. At his feet, there was a beetle with black armoured back emerging out of shit. My shit. The beetle seemed a model of purposiveness, and with rare ease, Sod rose from the ground, stood upright, and started to walk on the very tips of his toes. 
You'd never done this before, and the feeling was abstract and insane. He continued on, feeling that he might gingerly goose step into the air. His thigh wound was aching like a curse, while all the rest of him seemed to be gently materialising. No end to the surprises of flesh. With his head upright and his cheek half crushed, Sod started tip-treading through the wood. He had no idea of a direction, but after half a day, he realised he'd arrived on the fabled heath. It was so long since he had been here. A crystal beard framed his lips. He felt as fragile as glass stretched to its very thinnest possibility. He knew he was on the brink of a shattering fit, worse perhaps than ever before. And yet it seemed quite unexpectedly that he could live upon this brink. He held all other thought at bay as he moved across the heath, his body strangely quivering. He flinched to see the bodies of gorse around him, huddled and flaring with their pain. And now, as though by magic, a ransacked castle bobbed into view. It looked adrift, deserted, peculiar, altogether like a dream. That is my father's house. He was sweating profusely. The fit was hanging in the air as keen and glinting as a knife. His itching eye swept the surrounding waste. That is my father's garden. With the dexterity of dream, he bounded up Dunsinane Hill. In what seemed seconds, he arrived at the castle gates. A goat trotted by. For a moment, Sod thought to jump on its back and ride in like that. But as quickly as the thought came, the goat left. The bones of fish stood heaped in a hill near a shed. The heap was very neat. Sod thought of all the wounds dealt here. All those red wounds. Perhaps he could spend the rest of his life tending to this garden, hanging red wounds like roses upon trellises of bone. His lips were twitching now, but still he repelled the fit. He knew he had to go on. Sod bowed his head deliberately and stepped through his father's gates. Birds flew round Sod's grass-stained forehead. They chirruped and coupled in the air. Sod battered them away and took a long swill of the atmosphere. He smelt washing on the line and ran to the underwear, flapping cleanly on the breeze. He wrapped some long johns round his face and sniffed long and hard. His mind's eye saw a grizzled man watching and scoffing, lazing in a hammock, a giant bullring through his nose. Macbeth is alive. Sunship coursed hostly through Sod's veins. He was tender and blazing and young. His cheek yearned to brush against his daddy's cheek. Macbeth is alive! Sod knew exactly what he was here for. He noticed a man-sized open window. He jumped eagerly on the castle ramparts like a huge bedraggled cat. Oh, my manly father! He all but sang it out. He was a raw thing now, a living blush. With that, he rose on two legs, hulled hard against the stone wall and shuffled along sideways, wedging the back-turned hooks of his hands into every crack and crevice. Sunset commenced as he reached into the open window. A green curtain billowed. It was the most indisputable green. My green. His nostrils were twitching, greedy for their father's scent. He negotiated the precipice. He stood at the extreme verge, his toes clenched around the ledge. Sod stepped through the curtain and the stage was set. A man was lying on the bed. There was no mistaking the old duke. He had a face like a clown, red nose, hangdog eyes, skin that would peel at a touch. Sod hardened into oneness with his father. As though by gift, he saw a small knife on the bedside, a fruiting knife, a letter knife, something designed for precision. Sod smiled a precise smile and lifted the knife with thumb and finger. He held it high above his head and weaved it in the air. I am Macbeth. He looked round for his audience, and now before him was a single boy. He'd seen this boy before some years ago, but here before him was another thing entirely. This boy was on that cusp, the troubled cusp between child and adult. He was staring at Sod with undisguised disdain. Sod turned his feet like a ballerina and aimed his dagger's point at the boy. This boy was so beautiful that he took Sod's breath away. Every other beauty was but a shard and prophecy of this. He looked the beautiful boy up and down as he did his oriental dance. The boy didn't move a muscle. His sneer expressed the simplest contempt. 
Sod looked down for a moment at his own bedraggled carcass and he blushed. His left elbow rested on his hip, the forearm cocked and the palm spread wide like a turkey's tail. His body was absurd, he knew it, but try as he could, it would not straighten. He lowered his body balletically and then like an old wrinkled tortoise, he nuzzled his head upon the slope of the boy's soft neck. Such beauty deserves tribute. It requires it. Sod, pl Sod planted his dry kiss on the boy's unmoving face. The boy looked amused, but Sob was hyperventilating slightly. He felt a flushing wave of fear. He felt like the only animated thing in a world frozen against him. This is my scene, bosun. His dagger quivered over his head. Yeah. He made a stabbing motion into empty air. Yeah, I am Macbeth. He clicked the heels of his clogs and dragged the soles exaggeratedly backwards across the tiles. Now he heard a sniff and a sob. A child's cry. That is why he was here, to save the children from grief. He revolved prematurely on the ball of his right foot, the dagger still held over his head, quivering like a weather vane. On the far side of the bed was another boy, a little younger but huge, sniffing snot from his nose, not the slightest sign of weeping. Sod tittered in a high falsetto. Yeah, you fell fat from the bed. I mean flat. <laughs> Hello, said the younger one, rubbing his eyes. I am come to prevent evil. I am come to save. Save who? said the younger one. The old man lay dead still in his bed. Sod looked down at his sleeping victim and once more started executing little steps. Every nerve in his body was tightened to a pitch. The veins in his forehead and neck stood alarmed. As he got closer to his victim, his little steps degenerated into a demented shuffle. He was buzzing with excitement. The two boys watched, the lovely one half smiling. Sod's arms were describing vast arcs in the air. Now he was positioned plumb for the kill. He spun round, he spun right around on his foot and brought the knife home in a great downward sweep. He jutted out his right leg, pretended a bow, and in a delicate sweep inserted the knife deep into his own upper thigh. He's already deep. The porter turned over and rattled a horrible liquid snore. The beautiful boy laughed loudly. The fat boy looked quizzical and concerned. And now a third boy emerged from the shadows behind the beautiful one's shoulder. He scowled with low brow at the maniac intruder. Sod stood up straight and pinched his nostrils theatrically. Blood was pouring from his thigh. The knife hung apologetically. He started making his way backwards out the door. Don't you see what I would have done? Don't you see I'd have done it for you? The beautiful boy's eyes were hard as he watched the goblins retreat. Don't you see? Not for daddy, for you, you boys. Who else was there to care for them? For you boys, I see. He had meant to save them from a terrible guilt. Parasite was an awful thing to grow up to. Parasite! Parasite, said the third boy. What is that word? Yeah! What is that word? Murder. Or, or murderer. A father, a brother, or a king. The serious boy looked straight at Sod, concentrated and suspicious. The beautiful boy stopped laughing. Let's get him, he said. Grimmy, Grimmy, come on, don't let him escape. Sod was terrified. He dropped the knife, sniffed like a rabbit, and darted out of the door in what he prayed was empty space. He found stairs, miraculous, and bounded down them and outside in a breathless jiffy. He could hear the laughter behind him as a flurry of stones and gravel pinged his back and landed on the ground around. The fit was upon him. He could feel it smudging yellow across his vision. His wound throbbed like a summons as he high-stepped around the castle's backside and down the darkening hill. He caught his breath against a friendly tree. He felt molted clean of feather. There was thunder in his head and beads of sweat on his brow. He began tearing at his clothes. It was cold and he wanted to feel it. What in hell's name was he doing with all these children? He sprawled in the dirt and remembered his boyhood, Ross, the boy of tears, wringing his hands and sighing out unheard warnings. The little boy wizard, seeing all of the horrors that his daddy would do, 
but speaking nothing for fear of daddy, daddy who made the nightmares true. Old foolish innocence, hanging by a thread. Old foolish innocence, slaughtered in his bed. He should have ended it when the old king died right there and there. He should have sliced his own neck like a boy lamb and lain down to die on the corpse of the king. It would have served his daddy right. Those old hags in the nunnery were right. He was sick. He was corrupt. He was a body ripe for punishment. Sod blackened his face and reduced his clothes to rags. He found the nearest nameless town. It was formless and ugly, peppered with disbanded soldiers and refugees and parentless children. He sat against a stone and dozed fitfully. He kept seeing old King Duncan's body, all doomed and old enveloped in its haze of urinous gas, and his kind face so ordinary and uncrowned, and his royal nightshirt wide open to the white tummy, and his sick brown blood dripping from his chicken skin, and... Sister Rose, is that you? Sod started from his sleep and saw the familiar form of the abbess, older and thinner, amazingly clean and close before him. It is you, isn't it? Sod didn't know what to say. He wanted to hide in his wing like a baby bird. You've been a fool, sir. Sod bashfully nodded his little head. Go to the chapel, confess your sins, ask for forgiveness. The Lord is mercy. He shook his head and once more tried to bury it in his chest. You are weak and shiftless, sir. You are a deceiver. Expose yourself to judgment. Sod looked up weakly at his accuser. The abbess's face was like white bone, paired to the very element. Oh, for a countenance like hers. The Lord commands exposure. He shook his head. No, sir. Sod began to shake his head again, but stopped himself. It's just a can't. Can't, sir? I cannot go to a church. There is nowhere else for you. You are lost without the Lord. There is you. Me, sir? I will expose myself to you, holy sister. The abbess smiled, dabbling her lips with some linen. I am sure you do not mean that. Oh, sister, I'm a miserable, tainted thing. Surely. I am, I am. I saw the old king's horses eat each other. The abbess smiled more gently now. I held a cushion at the coronation. I smirked at the king as he had fits at feasts. I heard sighs and groans and shrieks, but marked them not. Every day I heard the dead man's knell, but scarce asked for who. I saw good men's lives sicken and die, and gathered for myself the flowers in their caps. I did. I did. Hush, man, to say such things. I did it. I picked out foredoomed children. I saw that, sir. I saw your trespass with children. Keep away from the young. Yes, sister. You have no business with children. No, sister. Shrive me, sister, and I shall. I am not your confessor, sir. Hear me, please. I picked out foredoomed children. I picked over their tiny corpses I made away with keepsakes. I was the bogeyman with his cut of bone. You were speaking gibberish, man. No, missus, no! Missus! I'm sorry, holy sister. Believe me, I hid in a tree and I fingered this cut, this one. I fingered it lovingly as my father was stuck upon a pole. Enough, be silent. You are a profane and sinful and very foolish man. I am, I am. Thank you, sister. Thank you. It's not a cause for thanks, sir. No, sister, thank you. I'm a miserable, tainted thing, sister. You are that, sir. I am, sister. I saw it all and I said nothing. It? The king's murder. Kings? Which king? All of them, both of them, the old kings and daddies, I could have stopped. Daddies? What do you speak of? I was, I am, sister, I am his son. 
The abbess's eyes were wide and horrified. I am, holy sister. I am his son. His? That butcher's? The abbess hurriedly crossed herself. You should not be here. You are his creature. The taint is upon you. It is, ma'am. I am sorry. You are sin, sir. Sin. I am, ma'am. You are very right. What should I do? Be gone. Go. Pray for cleanliness and leave. But go where, ma'am? Anywhere far from here. A, a hole in the ground. A grave, ma'am? A grave is too good for you. Yes, ma'am. No, no, I do not mean that. We, you were all Christians. It's un I mean, I mean, keep away from others if you can. We all are tainted by sin. Yours is great, very great, but but you are a child of Christ still. I am, sister. Of course, we are all the children of sin, only... Only, sister. You, you were not made for fellowship. No. Keep away as, as best you can from society. Yes, sister. It is best. It is. No to say. No more than is safe. Keep from temptation and keep others from temptation. You bear a terrible burden, my friend, being the child of such sin. Sod nodded like a child. Keep others from sin. Do you understand? Keep from sin. Keep others from sin. But yourself from others. Keep myself from others and others from sin. I can do that, sister. I am glad. The abbess tried to smile. Sod could feel himself strangely cheering up. And no children. No, keep yourself from children. And children from sin. That's right, sir, that's right. Sod moved toward her, Sod bowing moved. her head like a boy. But the abbess instantly retreated. No blessing, ma'am. The abbess was leaning away as though from a festering pestilence. Bless you, may Christ save you from your sins. I must go. Thank you, ma'am, and bless you too. The abbess moved quickly away, her robes blindingly white in the moonlight. Sod smacked his lips together. He felt terrific. A burden shirt is a burden less. Ha <laughs> ha! He could not recall feeling so light. His wound had settled and the pain in his brow relaxed. A little boy went by chewing a bad apple. He giggled when Sod poked out a tongue. Sod felt a brief urge to chase the boy and ask if he might share his apple. Tell them what not to do. Show them a better way. That's what the abbess was hinting. Sort of. Sod's mouth curved once more in a crooked smile. He looked at his encrusted flesh, at his legs like a strung hairs, and felt a hot, violent shiver of shame. Ugh, do you what you're told for once in your sick life. Those old hags were right. The abbess was right. He shall live. A man forbid. Keep away a foul piece of corruption. Or let them come to him. Again, his smile curved like a weed. He was a miserable, tainted thing, to be sure. And that's it. Thank you. So we're going to go back to Mike now. Yes, we are. Thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to, well, first I want to thank you for the reading. I think the texture of this story is um, vocal. So being able to hear you read aloud and to be the voices, but also be the source of the narrative was wonderful. And it, it, it's actually a great piece to hear as well as read. I thought I would try to put some compass points out there for us to discuss and I'll work off of the reading, but I, I'm sure we can move in some other directions too. So observation one, this is a story that has a lot of things in it. I wrote, I kept a list of some of the nouns <laughs> that were appearing a bad apple, a beetle, a suicidal bat, grass-stained foreheads, red wounds, fish bones, a goat, a grizzled man. So observation one is that there are a lot of entities moving around in this universe and uh, they seem almost to float as if in a fish tank in water in different spots. And so 
Um, why is that the case? That's, that's question one. Uh, or observation one with a question two. Um, this style of the piece is reminiscent, well, I, let's suppose that Francis Pange met Spencer and made a film with David Lynch on a script written by H.P. Lovecraft. I wanted to ping a couple of reference points there for surrealism, uh, the fascination with objection and corruption, the massive indifference of the universe to suffering, uh, which Lovecraft was really interested in, but also uh, the love of discontinuity. And uh, as in the Fairy Queen, a landscape that is full of allegorical possibility. Um, and one reaction I have when I read and hear this is that there's a, a kind of an interspace that is the space of this fiction. And there are characters who are coming out of rooms that are entirely other fictional universes. They bring with them experiences and traumas which are weirdly absent and they talk about them. So question two, you don't have to answer these, but I'm, I'm just tossing them out as, as reaction points. Um, what is that structure doing? Why, why does it work for this particular kind of story? And that's an open-ended question. The last um, was about atmosphere. I, I feel a bit like this fiction is you didn't take the characters from Macbeth, but you did take the atmosphere. And having an atmosphere conjure a fiction is a different kind of adaptation than ones that write the backstories of characters. I do know that you are writing the backstories of some important characters who, who could go back into the Macbeth room and maybe will and are carrying with them their own stories but the generative principle seems to be the atmosphere. And that is very striking. And as a way of thinking about where fictions are generated, where do they come from? I, I remember, uh, I'm not sure exactly what theorist said it, but every fiction has a belly button, an omphalos, a place where it detached from reality and, and it leaves a mark. And the place where this fiction detached feels like the murderous deaths, the, the, the action of murder from Macbeth. And somehow this other universe has detached, gassed up, opened, expanded. And uh, so why is it that that particular trauma seems to be both absent and generative? There are my three observations. I'm ready to have you ask or say whatever you want, but perhaps that's a good way to start a conversation. Yeah, well, they're fantastically fertile and suggestive, Mike, and I'm sure we can't respond to all of that, but we can have a bash at some of them. So should we should we start with things, Simon? Yeah. I think it was the first one. Do you want to, to kick us off? Okay. Um, it's interesting, right, right at the start of the novel, there's a, um, a moment when the porter wakes up and, um, He's been a sort of asleep during the during the battle that, that ends the play, and he wakes up in a ditch. And in the ditch are uh, various things like an old stool and so forth. And and they're and they're objects that have been kind of detached from the play. And we're discovering as though we're living in a sort of world which is which is detrital, um, but also a, a, a kind of detrital is one, but also a kind of compost. And we were interested in the in the idea of a compost. It was actually right at the very start of con conceding of the of the of the book. You and I were playing with the idea of a compost, which is both crap stuff you chuck away, but also it's generative. It it, it kind of re sort of re I don't know what the term is. It sort of re fertilizes or whatever. And I think we were we were thinking that objects, whether they're animate or in inanimate, whether they were um, images, verbal images, visual images, whatever, um, anything that was in the play might be as it were, generative, but they were also unhoused. They, they were definitively and foundationally 
unhoused, as though once upon a time there'd been a, a, a castle with rooms, but that was no more. And what we had were all of these, all of these elements, these constituents, these participants, these remainders of this place, which had been um, decomposed, dismembered. And so what we had were the, were the shards, the, the remnants, and, and a world had to be built from that. And I think that was a foundational thing that it was a sort of democracy of objects, if you like, that we were thinking about. And um, anything, literally anything might be the generative thing, be the thing which, which, which gathers um, motive, which gathers sort of drive and anything. Um, and so when you're talking about the, in that, in the scene, that the, the, these floating things, you know, that, that they're, on the one hand, they do have, I mean, each one of the things So the goat, for example, floats in and floats out. The, the goat has a, has, a, has a purpose in the story and that the, 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 the kids were fed on goat's milk. That's all they had for the first few years of their life. The, the baby particularly was fed on goat's milk. And so it, 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 it's a link to that. But at the same time, it's a, it's a, it's a, the goat itself is a kind of remnant. It's kind of lost, hmm. this lost thing. So there's no homes. It's kind of, we wanted to make it, I think, that there's no, there's no domesticity really. Domesticity is a dream or a fiction or, or, a, or, a, or a, an illusion. And it, it, domesticity defined by a room with a, a space, which is room with walls and furniture, which you can rely on, that sort of stuff. None of that exists in this world. And I think that we wanted to build, build, a, build a world out of an idea of there's, circulate, there's remainders as he's circulating objects, images, et cetera, but they, they, they've got, they, conca they, they, they can concatenate in unfor unforeseen and unforetold ways. Um, anyway, that's that sort of idea. Yeah, yeah no, in, 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 indeed. And that is a really interesting question. I think sort of critically speaking, I suppose some, some people listening are thinking, thinking about what this might mean critically. And I think that was really basic here as well. And I suppose it relates to what you say about atmosphere, Mike. I mean, you know, where, where is the meaning of Macbeth? Where is the agency? It's not exactly in story. Um, it might be, um, it might be anywhere. As, as, as Simon says, there are various things that linger in, in the play, I mean, you know, and did in us, and some of them had a larger position in our experimental drafts than they, they came to have in the fight. So you, we sort of tested the potential for agency within this particular story for, of, for instance, the Shardborn Beetle who is in there, um, of the uh, one, one very important early discussion that Simon and I had an experiment we, we, we made was, um, with the, the dogs that, that Macbeth has that extraordinary leering, menacing speech, as many people listening will, or if not everybody will, will know when he brings the, the two murderers of, of, of you know, ideally of, of Banquo and Flans back in and says, did you get them? And then he's, he goes through this extraordinary catalogue of, 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 of kinds of dog. I mean, it's, 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 it's immensely wasteful in terms of in terms of plotting in such an economic play in, in a sense and Simon and I were very interested in the weird agency that of, of this apparently unnecessary material that you I think you've kind of put your finger on there and I think another thing we felt was that almost the, the critical history of Macbeth has been written around two or three set of speeches and as we worked on it, and it was an immense indulgence in some ways, we, 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 we inhabited or as, as well as we could, you know, almost every line, almost every phrase of the play it became a source of critical creative obsession. And it was much more sustaining because there was somebody else doing it. It wasn't just something you were, were doing on your, your own. And we, we, we came to feel that almost, I mean, it sounds, it sounds like a strap line, but, but all, almost every speech, almost, almost every phrase had generative potential you know it could be that kind of envelope that you suggested that that there was a sort of poetic density in 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 Macbeth that was to do with its moral meaning and menace and existential life but that often couldn't be conveyed in in linear argumentative criticism and I think we were genuinely thinking well you know how how do you do justice to that you know that that might well be the thing that and I I, I assume that people live Listening, I assume that it's not just madness on mine and Simon's part that, that, that reading a play like Macbeth, the thing that might stick in your mind might be 
um, a line or an image or, uh, and again, there were so many of them that, that violent grief became, this has become a modern ecstasy was another one that, that and as, as if the world could be completely disclosed freshly in, in that phrase. And we wanted to try to build a coherent fiction and in, in case anyone might buy and read the read the book, we work very very hard on the story, and there is a story. It's a it's a there is a linear story, um, but we but we wanted some of that excess hairiness, that that life that continental, um, you know, that French criticism complained so much about in Shakespeare. We wanted to bring that back into writing about Shakespeare, and we wanted to re re experience it freshly. So, so there was all of that, and then. It's sort of probably saying too much, but then as, as in terms of the object thing that you pick up is very resonant because we did when we talked about this we we, we did didn't we Simon we 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 did talk about almost a surreal painting as we tried to feel our way into this we sort of marooned enormous objects and of course there's no more important or significant redolent object than Macbeth's head but it's part of that kind of continuum of objects that you've pointed to. And a metaphor might have the same ontological value. I think it does. In the, that, that the dogs are as, as alive as, as you know, some of the characters more than Malcolm or whatever, you know. Um, so so we, were, we were trying to, it, you know, without it being a sort of drunken theoretical thing, just saying that that's what it's like reading the play um, nakedly, really. Um, and in a sense, we we just wanted to express that, to, to get to give life to it, to share it and almost as an act of permission as well to say that, you know, you we could talk about this, we could work with this. And that's maybe where you, as you say, this atmosphere becomes the generating thing. And atmosphere is a very elusive thing, critically. It's a very elusive thing to pin, pin down. Um, and I think it, it was an intoxicating thing to work on for, for, for both of us, I think. And um, because, because of that, because it felt like entering the world that you're, you write at an angle to normally, or we discuss it at, at an angle. I, I'm struck by the concept that Shakespeare himself was a myriad minded writer. There were thousands of items kind of coursing yeah. through his mind and unchecked generativity which uh, you seem to be grappling with because fra both phrases and orphaned objects yeah. can start to generate scenario yeah. and affect. So uh, now we're in the realm of literary criticism, but I, I do think, uh, sure. I think, I think it, I don't know if this is a novel of ideas, I would ask you, but, but it, it does feel like it's pushing at something. Yeah. And it is pushing against something uh, so let me pause here because I have some questions from uh, those who are watching. Sure. I'm going to read all four so that they're out there. And then I, I will ask you to react and perhaps we can circle into and out of them. So a question from Sean. Were you inspired by any examples of creative criticism when writing this book? Uh, what were they? So creative criticism, is there, is there that piece to talk more about? From Sean, uh, would you describe, okay, so it's what's the difference between fan fiction and creative criticism? Uh, fan fiction, I think, is another very interesting topic, certainly with Shakespeare, you know, as much as Star Trek or other kinds of very fan fiction friendly writers, you are in that, you're at that convention. Let's put it that way. Uh, from Matthew, how would you differentiate creative criticism from intertextuality, if at all? Uh, and then finally from John, this is a treasure chest of language, agree? How did the composing process work? How did you collaborate? Okay, so, shall I take one of them? Um, the, there's the, the questions about creative criticism and intertextuality are, are, are in a sense similar questions because I th I think I'm I think I'm correct in saying that we we weren't particularly influenced by what would what would you regularly identified as creative criticism of of you know Shakespeare but what we were certainly influenced by are, are works which we um, understood were read as in different ways responses to Shakespeare, um, often in um, unexpected ways or barely recognized ways. And so 
works like Moby Dick or um, Wuthering Heights or a lot of Dostoevsky um, or philosophical works. I mean, you, you mentioned your novel ideas. I mean, a huge influence was Kierkegaard, um, enormous influence upon both of our, our, our thinking. Um, and um, his, his works themselves being, you know, creative, critical, if you like, in all, in all sorts of ways. So that kind of strain of, of, of works which, which assimilate, absorb, rework, um, you know, Shakespeare, not just Shakespeare, of course, Dr. Faust, Thomas Mann's, lots of stuff like that. We were, we were reading Wagner. These, these, this kind of, all the stuff, one of the reasons why you and I worked together is because apart from the fact we were good friends and had a laugh together, we sort of shared this hinterland um, of stuff that we read as kind of passionate sort of people in the middle of, in, as it were, in the middle of nowhere growing up. I was in Tasmania and Ewan was in well, Scotland or Hong Kong or Maidenhead. Maidenhead. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and, and at 16, 17, reading the same things, um, which so many young kids do. Um, and so it was, it was anyway, so it was, it was that sort of stuff was, was the inspiring thing rather than we weren't, we weren't influenced at all by any of the recent Shakespeare books, the, the Hogarth Shakespeare books. Um, they, they sort of contempt, they were sort of contemporaneous with, with our process or slightly after it actually um, in many ways. And so that, and so that also is to do with the intertextuality question where the, 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 uh, uh, the, the, the Macbeth Macbeth is intertextual in multiple ways, sort of all the time. Um, but it's, inter, it's, it's, it's intertextual, not just with Macbeth, but, but the big one that, we, that we've sort of um, you know, acknowledged was, was uh, the, the Brothers Karamazov, um, which when you and I, initially, um, we, we planned to write a, just a kind of work that's more recognised with literary criticism, which sort of sought to get inside the chamber, don't the chamber, the thing that Macbeth, which Shakespeare never does, which get inside the murder chamber. And we were trying various ways of using literary criticism, different voices, um, different methods to try and do it, but it just came out unbearably pretentious and 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 um, you know just just false. And we then, sitting in my room in Oxford, we just came upon this idea of what that we we identified sort of together, identified. That Brothers Karamazov is has the same basic plot, kind of pivoting upon them a murder halfway through, and we also at the same sort of almost at the same time recognise that the um, if that, that the four brothers in in Dostoevsky's novel that there's a, the sensualist, the intellectual, the, the the saintly one, and then the kind of the weird uh, sort of in the shadows bastard brother. They, they, they all in, had different aspects of Macbeth, what we, Macbeth, and so we just came up on the idea of splitting Macbeth up. So the whole thing is, in, and then the Gru figure, there's Gruok is a figure from Scottish history, but then Gru, Grushenka is the heroine in um, Dostoevsky's novel. Uh, and so there, there were these sort of serendipities. And so that was something which was there the whole time. And, um, and so there was a there was this kind of, there, there was a play, there, there was, we were working with literary traditions and all, and all kinds of, in, in not just literary traditions, imaginative traditions, philosophical traditions in all kinds of ways, all the time um, we, we were going, you know, you and yeah. Yeah, yeah no, indeed. And I mean, a couple of things strike me in, in relation to the questions and to what you've just said, Simon. Um, what, one is that, that, you know, I've seen a bit more of it since, since Simon and I started working on this, but in a good rehearsal room, you know, actors have to, and, and directors have to it's whatever works <laughs> whatever whatever will get you into the world um and there was an element of that that we so on the one hand we we, we wanted a kind of discipline so we wanted everything to come from Macbeth and almost have that kind of looking at you Mike which of course people can't see but <laughs> have that kind of warranted you, you know kind of authenticating uh, return to an object or an, or an image or or, 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 a, or a, you know the life of the play um, on the other hand as Simon's just illustrated we you, you know whatever weapons we needed it was it was it was it was it was a kind of double 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 think and again that was really exhilarating and um, it's of course not what you know a historicist uh, criticism does many things and many things really well um, but 
it doesn't quite do that, you know, in a, in a seminar, you know, whatever you need from, from literary history or from, I mean, Simon, Simon's mentioned philosophy, but the history of art was also, El Greco was a big, particularly for Simon, was a big generating um, force, force for us. And it, there was an immense permission in that. I mean, what, what, how, whatever will get us closer both to our world, which is, which was a fully elaborated reading. I mean, in a sense, it's as simple as that. It's a, it was a fully, I mean, it seems enormously um, audacious to do something after Shakespeare in a way, but then we started to think that it really isn't. It's what every passionate reading is and does. And to some extent, that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to create one you know, monument to that where you really take a fully experienced reading and make, you, you know, make an image of the world of it. Um, but we've, strongly felt and it, it was helpful to be working with someone else in this so you know that that had to be a kind of you know something that is is kind of always done in the living most intense response of or always a possibility um, so that was that was interesting that 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 occurs to me and on the fan fiction thing i mean it it I mean, it's an interesting question. It's not not something I think we particularly thought about. We probably need to hear from the questioner what they they thought about it. But what, one thing that does strike strike me that that is perhaps not harder to admit, but it, but if there was a kind of fan fiction element in it, in, it, it might have been a sort of Macbeth fandom. You know that that we we what we wanted to do was get so to get into the ethics of the play by inhabiting the play not stand in always sort of preempted judgment um over Macbeth but but be imminently involved in the ethic in, in the ethics of the play as they as they work themselves out in a real world of objects and passions and um and you know false turns and so and, and so forth and so I, I think again early on we did think no we're going to and again perhaps rather like actors we're going to we're going to step into those those parts and then we tried to step into as many of them as we could and then we discovered it that, and this was a kind of dramatic quality of writing the thing the different ca characters of ours would would start to come to the fore ethically so the one that we introduced you to um when we reread it for this second edition I mean, we both felt actually this this kind of ross derived character who is utterly unheroic as you heard um but in another way is is you, you know, there's a kind of heroic virtue in the attempt, and in some ways, his secondariness and outsidership is sort of central. And perhaps also, he's a figure for the reader. He's the one who takes it on. He's the one who who isn't in the play but is absolutely of it. So there were those sorts of things, and and then I suppose related to that idea of a kind of Big Beth fandom, we, we wanted to take seriously the myth of the play, which becomes a bit of a, a lovey cliche about 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 not saying the, the word Macbeth and so forth. But those things tend to have sources. And we started to think it is that kind of doom laden, irrevocable fatedness, uh, driven accidents. And you know, think of your work there, Mike. But um, of, and what does it mean to come after that? I mean, the, 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 there is a kind of belatedness in literary histories. What does it mean to come after Shakespeare? That a massive determinant. So I don't know whether it's, it's there's maybe some fandom but also some sense of crushed subjection in it and <laughs> and it seemed to resonate with you know it seemed to resonate with our times politically at that time and they've changed again but um, I, sorry that was a rambling response but I, no i i mean i love hearing you guys talk about your work because you both are uh you both are able to capture not positions so much but values ways of 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 seeing what would be good to do as a critic or as a writer now. I think you, you both have really strong opinions about that. And the work feels a bit like an, I, I guess it's an ethical allegory. What do you do with this, this situation? But it's funny because it only works once you've really exploded the world into these floating pieces. Mm. Um, you, you, you've got to put your actors into the allegory in a certain state. And, and some of that, I don't know, I don't think you could get at some of these ethical stances that, and values that you are trying to work through without that particular scenario and scene. 
Mm -hmm. It just strikes me as interesting. It does also connect, I think, to some of the work that's going on in uh, speculative realism and mm -hmm. object-oriented ontology. I was thinking of Quentin Mayasu's After Finitude, where this incredible uh, mind has been set at the problem of showing that at any instant the universe could become something completely different. Mm, it's interesting. And, and really pulling, putting, putting out some good arguments for why that needs to remain a logical possibility all the mm. time. That's uh, yeah, that's but, it, but, but there's not there's not the scene setting and ethical stance that that I think you are exploring. Uh, so I, I just want to connect it to our current moment. I also think uh, oh, so I see another question here from Maria. How might you approach your approach to the play inform and energize more traditional styles of criticism? Uh, his plays are very hard to approach naked, and and I'll just observe. You guys should answer this yourselves. But when I go back to Macbeth after having read this, I really do pay attention to atmosphere, objects, floating phrases that seem to have generative power, and that that's something I love to think about. But I I feel like I think about Macbeth and am more sensitive to those aspects of the play having encountered this. Can I I, I think can you um just there was a question I mean, I think what you're saying is is right and I think I think that the that all of these all of these issues kind of go together I think that, that so so that the, the question we had before about language and so forth and, and your, your questions about ethics and allegory um, and what, what you what your observation earlier Mike about about place about, about how you know the, these you know comparing it to the fairy queen and 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 and, and, and places which seem to, to sort of float or to be untethered, or to be surprising, or to be generated by the situation, as opposed to be simply the kind of location of the situation. I think that's absolutely the case, and I, and I think that's all of the all of those things are, are expressions of of um, this well, this unfixed world, as we were saying before, this world which is which is under probation, in probation, you know, a, pro a probational world. Um, and a, a probational not only in itself as a sort of fantastical, uh, you know, mimetic world, but also probational as an experience of uh, certainly of writing it, but I hope of of reading it where you where you, where, you, where it's it's not fixed. You, there, there is that sense in which the ground beneath your feet is not entirely secure. Um, but that in turn, I mean, again, that, that 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 question that we had about about relation to to criticism, I think I think. I mean, as Ewan's already suggested or foreshadowed that we were frustrated by, dissatisfied by, a little bit bored by a lot, a lot, a lot of the stuff that was being done about Macbeth. It was interesting that Macbeth really didn't seem to be um, by critics. I'm talking about not so much on the stage. Um, it, it, Macbeth didn't seem to be susceptible to the dominant methodologies of, of historians. Yeah, please say more about that. I think that's. Okay, so so Macbeth didn't sit, Macbeth didn't sit, didn't 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 seem susceptible to the to historicism or before that to new historicism. It just evaded it, and and you had some interesting stuff here and there, but really it was too it's too spectral, it's too it's too haunted, it's too strange, it's too posthumous, it's too it's too recursive, it's 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 sense of the, 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 its temporality is endlessly anachronic and forward and backward and so forth it, it, it simply doesn't work with a kind of a, a sort of positivistic historical historical model it just doesn't it just doesn't comply to that you have those kind of what what i always i think we both always thought were just hopeless attempts to tether it to jacobean history by kind of clinging to some you know james thing it just was so weak and 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 and, and it, it may have been true or not true but it was sort of irrelevant to what the play was fundamentally doing or what the sort of things that it, it it evokes and how it works and so and that that's i think what what that that required a break away from from these dominant methodologies because and and their notions of what what is evidence um what what is the you know what what is knowledge what is knowledge of a play? I mean, is knowledge of a play being kind of to map it onto some kind of pre-existing discourse or something? That just all of that, all of that seemed to be just monumentally inadequate, not completely irrelevant, but just inadequate. And so 
that's why so and so and that goes hand in hand with the sort of stuff we're talking about the sort of the phenomenology where you you know partly what we're talking about is creating a world which is which is in the image of a, a phenomenological experience or something like that and and in that sense where is the you know where is the play when is the play you know that those questions are the same as where or when is 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 Macbeth Macbeth our book you know where, when does it happen we don't name a time we don't say this is happening in the 11th century we don't say this is happening in 1606. We don't say this is happening now. We just let it be. We never, we never. Yeah, you know. I think it's, it's really interesting. Some of the energy behind this is iconoclastic in terms of the writing and the effects. And just to try to figure out where that's coming from, for, from you as a duo of writers, I do feel some of the frustration uh, with the inability to muster a critical response that feels experientially true to the fiction and the moment. And, and there's, a, there's some of that, um, it's not just frustration, it's a desire to just smash the stage and start over. Yeah. And I know there's more of a desire there and I do think there's desire behind the des what made you write this, but it also feels like there's a certain kind of clearing of the decks because you just can't get what you want started with the current tools. And, and I do think that's the belly button of this one. Well, that's true, and I think there's the. I mean, that there's the the the, 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 sort, the sort of decorum or decorums of, of literary criticism a bit can be a bit crippling. And you know, you that the, 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 it was it was you know, in some ways I regret that we didn't stick with our original aim to produce a sort of work of recognizably criticism which just broke all the rules, as opposed to creating a fictional world which we did. Because, but you know, that creates that, that it would have been quite interesting to have produced a critical work which was just completely disobedient and iconoclastic and you know, so forth, but remaining rather than taking refuge in story, you know what I mean? So, the I can character, I, as much I, as I, it was... <laughs> I can tell that the next unfair request of you two as writers would be to write a piece of traditional criticism which puts into action some of the insights that are generated by this story. Yeah. unreasonable but but i do think it oh, would no. be very yeah. interesting and and the more sober and reasonable the better <laughs> i just just yeah. no, I, I, of antonyms here uh i want to interject an additional question here and please i mean i don't want to interrupt you ewan but just to make sure it gets out there this is from uh subhankar he's writing was evocative and this this he is writing uh evocative and starkly visually were there specific visual references and cinematic references in your work? Yeah, but well, just I mean, was it, so the biggest the biggest vi visual reference was was El Greco, um, who, who you know the an artist contemporaneous with Shakespeare, and when one, one thing I did personally was I, I printed out, um, I, I ripped off the back of a cupboard from my daughter's bedroom. She didn't need the back. The cupboard didn't need a back. Don't, they don't need backs. So I ripped off the back of the cupboard and I printed out about 20 images from El Greco. And my printer was playing all these tricks. And it and it it didn't print the picture, it it or the painting, as it were, or the fresco. It painted a detail from it. It was really weird. These are these and, and so I had this kind of sort of pseudo storyboard of all these like eyes, a single eye from El Greco or a bit of a curtain or something. And they were behind my desk the whole time and and that was an absolute inspiration just because it just seemed to, that sort of baroque strange stretched world um seemed to be really Mac macbethian to me so that was that was the single thing which was most to me but ewan yeah no, we also talked a bit about bergman didn't we simon and seven yeah. and so on um, yes absolutely yeah i mean just just to come in a little bit on the on the previous conversation i, I do think that it's possible to return to, to to return to criticism or to sort of harvest some of these these things after they've been hopefully demonstrated or at least experienced. And I mean, to some extent, German Romantic criticism prefigures them all. I mean, Schlegel says, you know, you can't you can't criticize except via poetry. You've got to. So that kind of and there's quite a lot of that for I mean, German Shakespeare prior to which precedes our own Anglo-American tradition to some extent is committed to the sorts of things we're doing uh, here. So I think sometimes we we forget how young criticism 
is I mean, and English studies is incredibly young. You know, there, are, there is no English studies before the 20th century, um, but it's become naturalized and reified for us. So I think that sense of, of just, again, one thing that, that, that interested, I mean, it is, it's not, a, you know, a necessary thing that the, the proper response to, to, to a play should be a linear essay. I mean, there's an extraordinary formal disjunction there so so playing with those those possibilities but also but it is true as you you intimate mike that, that of course reasonable pellucid criticism civilized criticism if you like can do all sorts of things and i you know we're not when we're, we're not trying to not one out of the order of the water in 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 terms of you know kind of delighted uh, you know anarchy um but i I think the other thing I want to say is that um, is just how radically powerful the play seemed to us as we were as we were writing it. I mean, some some of the imperatives do come from the play, so you could step away from fictive form into criticism. But that we we felt at least at times, and perhaps each of us at different times, and but certainly sometimes together, that 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 would have been a retreat. You know the the, the 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 form of the play it's it's delirious fictive power um was a was a massive challenge on the one hand but the other thing i want to say is that it it, it itself what you know it was theory and philosophy and and, and criticism you know that, that 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 for us i think there was a kind of primal um intellectual uh, power in the play that we and to some extent we had to 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 do you know however poor and after image it was we, we you know we we had to do homage to that by producing something um that was a an echo of it that was that did, didn't step away from it didn't retreat from it and of course then the play knows this and and that sense of the fatedness of the play that it repeats that they, that it's cursed that's what the curse means i think you know the, this fabled curse that we all joke about but but you, you know what what it means is this play is itself a model model of temporality that's been derailed and is re recurring and and we felt that in the play. So our, our, our fiction is meant to be another kind of, you know, iteration on the mortal coil of, of, of the Macbeth model of history, of thought, of art. Um, and that's what we were trying to do, I think, really. So we couldn't borrow the theoretical, term, much as we, you know, we're all, you know, there's some fantastic philosophical thinking. And I, want, I didn't know the, 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 the author you cited, but that sounds brilliant and absolutely resonant. Um, so it wasn't a matter of just saying nothing else is, is is doing that. It was saying that the play itself has foretold this. It's foretold us. It's foretold our politics. It's foretold. And we we had a very ambivalent relationship to that. I mean, there is, and that's the, the other part of the answer to the fan fiction que question. I think we were both totally fascinated by it, but all of us are, you know, we are also subjected to these things. Uh, f f f philosophically, artistically, you know, those of us who teach the same plays time and again, and time and again, you know, the culture recirculates and recycles them. Um, some of the iconoclasm you describe is, it, 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 you know, expresses that love-hate relationship. And um, but I, I also want to add there that, as as you know, that there's a world-building element in the play as well that the play is about a devastated world and, and what you do with a devastated world and i think macbeth is partly about that what would you do with the world after macbeth and one of the count our macduff as you know don't want to give away too much but but is is a, a constructive force you know he's uh, you, so there, there's he wants to feed the world he wants to remake the world and we wanted to know what that would cost you know we wanted to so we felt the play I think we really did, however mad it may sound, that we really did feel the play was reading us, it was reading our situation, that there was a kind of, so instead of a kind of authorial usurpation of, 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 of Shakespeare, a kind of proud attempt to, 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 to arrogate Shakespeare's authority and so forth, which all that, that of course always fails. It was more a sense that, what if we, instead of applying theory to the play, what if the play is theory? What if it, what, what, what if it is, it is its own best mode of criticism? Or what if it's got us caught in a loop? That's the kind of horror of the of our, our book. Yes, there I, is, the, yeah. 
So that's no, what I, 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 I completely sense that in the work. And I'm, I just in terms, I'm going to expand this kind of column of unfair observations about the work. <laughs> but I, I do sometimes think that this kind of work is a, is a desire for actual, actually, for an existentially compelling moral criticism. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to put that out there, especially the word moral, mm. yeah. because I think you're interested in it. I think the Fairy Queen is interested in it. I think Macbeth is in a very specific angled yeah. sense. Could you say a little about that? That, I mean, that that's, I mean, that, I do, I do, I do think that was, yeah, it's fu fundamental. We, we the the, mor the, mor the moral question, in a sense, began began with us with. As Ewan said about fan fiction and Macbethian, but the, the so, sort of the first thing we asked was the idea that what, what imagine imagine being Macbeth and that and and this idea of the tyrant or whatever the monster the butcher was, but that didn't mean anything to us. That what meant something was the idea that a good man might do this, that that you know a, a good man, the milk of human kindness. A, a, anything and the idea that anything is possible any of us any of us can go anywhere you know we really can and that and and taking it seriously not having some kind of Nietzschean sort of supremo idea of you know the over, over man nothing like that at all just just an idea of trying to get inside the possibility of error real error um and yes. ir, 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 irredeemably and and that was really really important and it was interesting that that you know we 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 with the three brothers or the four four brothers as it were we we each of them had their own this is where Dostoevsky was important because because you know such a such a sort of a figure who takes on the opposite and, and lives the anti self and all that sort of stuff and we were doing that as well trying to be and so in sort of inhabiting of this saintly Christian mm -hmm. boy without being remotely saintly or christian oneself and it's kind of interesting so you a sort of negative capability to like where you're kind of inhabiting an alternative and a way of being and trying to live it and therefore trying to and, and and then really and then that figure then ending up and then how vert so the the the, the, the idea that not i mean the idea with Macbeth, the, the cat, the character, the idea of what, what does he kill for? What does he do it for? And 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 kind of the answer is somehow unanswerable. What he, he doesn't he doesn't know why he does it. He has no reason to do it, or in, in some basic way. And that 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 idea that you can oh, yeah no I'm going to just interrupt you there, Simon, because I, I sometimes I find in tragedy what's terrifying about it is that there is no motive to cite, mm. or there's insufficient. Mm. And the gap is disturbing. Other versions of tragedy are there's actually a very specific reason why something has gone wrong, and you don't get a second run at it. Yeah, I mean, Macbeth, I think for sure is a, is a play about a moral er I mean, error. You've used the word, uh, but also the fact that uh, they're forward deciding, entailing terrible in the Greek, you know, sense yeah. terrible. But it feels like you you are interested in in also the unrepeated the, the fact that you don't get a second go and that's part of the finality of this play and others. I, I understand the ambiguity and the the, the we, humanistness of of Macbeth and the difficulty of really attaching to it. But there's actually something kind of specific about it too. Yes, yes, and 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 the 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 idea that, you, that it's inescapable that the the act is inescapable and and that that things really really do come home. And they um, it's not a spectator sport, you know. Um, when they Simon, it's then it's that the eternal recurrence become concrete, really. That they, as you you both say, I mean, it, it happens. It's it it it's it's real. It, it, in a sense, it's absolute, but then it. It reverberates. It's end. It's endless recurrence. So, and what what the eternal recurrence might be kind of theoretical f f phrase, but but is of course. But but it's art that might model it, or it's life that might model it, and that's a really frightening thing, you know. A, 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 apart from thought, um, yeah. it's what, not. One, the, sorry, oh, sorry. No, I was just going to say one of the reasons we took of the form we did is because i mean there really isn't i mean it's interesting what you say mike is because there really isn't much morally um in mo morally frank criticism 
That's right. In More recent years, in the 19th century. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And 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 you know, you have to you have to adopt this pose of detachment and um, you know, after it's all dative and after the events. And I, you know, I, I'm a bit bored with that. And I, and I, and I, so so, but then at the same time, you, you know, and it's it was interesting that the one the one time that you and I tried to write a a a, a, a work of criticism together about about this project it was it, we really couldn't find a voice and mm-hmm. and we ended up sounding strident and 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 shrill and sort of mad um and of course we are whereas in the in the play in the in the, in the story you can put stridency and shrillness and madness into a character and it, it's 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 easier but there's i there, i think there was i i do share what you're saying and i, I do think there's an interesting way in which you know it, it is an ethical thing i mean the, you know if the humanities are going to survive it's for it's for it's for ethical and moral <laughs> reasons as much as anything else. It really is. I, um, I, I could I couldn't agree with you more. Although the meaning of those words are, is different and has to be adequate to our situation. Absolutely. Yeah, clearly, yeah. clearly, it needs to be updated. But I I agree. Yeah, that yeah, yeah. As, a mo- as a motive of criticism, it remains incredibly powerful, and yeah. you too seem drawn to it. Yeah. Yeah. I think the Joseph North book is is read resonant there isn't it because he he suggests that there's criticism and scholarship and that that we've tilted very radically in the direction of scholarship and calls for a, a sort of rebalancing which, which might correspond to the sort of call you're making but I, I again I, I think what I'd return to there is is book groups and um you know young readers and 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 in, in enthusiasts I mean I, it doesn't and I wouldn't necessarily use the word fan but just what what does it mean to read? What is it? I mean, again, we 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 it, mm. academically we look for words like phenomenology and so forth. But I think we just the sim this the simple magic and you, you know the presencing power. And again, I've used another phrase that's not native to the to, to the thing, but um, of reading a book of being powerfully possessed by it, of it reshaping your experience of of you know. Um, and in to some extent in ultimate terms you know that that, that it, it that that's a power that, that that art can have and that language can have and it, and literary language as as that language sort of worked to its utmost can have and i i think we we need to you know we need to switch that back on we need to make it kosher to and and available and then it will speak to our questions and problems and and and, and you know we should speak back to it and, and so forth I have always been struck by the optimism that both of you have. Uh, in, I mean, this is a deeply pessimistic fiction. It's deracinated, it's ruined. Uh, but as critics, I think you, you have some sense that we could write criticism or read fiction in ways that are significant, that are adequate. Um, and, and you haven't given up. I mean, most of the time, I mean, the kind of off the shelf, really reductive anarcho, you know, reading of postmodernism as well. It's just a bunch of crazy stuff. And it's because there's no, there's nothing left anymore, right? We're in the ruins. Uh, that seems completely at odds with what you're, what you are doing with these materials. And I just, I think that's an interesting um, variant on what one might expect from this type of writing. I want to ask you, uh, since we're at one nineteen, or my time zone, uh, 19 after the hour, uh, it has often struck me that there's an energy in Shakespeare's writing and perhaps in his plotting in the romances, but specifically in the writing that has some of the love of discontinuity and disjunction that I associate with surrealism. And clearly you have had a massive encounter with surrealism. Uh, what, how could we go back to Shakespeare's style or his manner of present, presenting a world? And I mean, we don't need him to be a precursor of surrealism, mm. but I do think that word helps mm. for getting us into certain aspects of his writing. Mm. Uh, so, you know, if you were writing a, an assignment that was a recipe for a student to produce <laughs> this type of fiction, uh, <laughs> actually, it'd be quite interesting if you could come up with the prompt that would produce this fiction. And it would be interesting to see students grapple with it. Uh, I know a, a teenage 
students who I've encountered are re always ready to produce fiction mm -hmm. uh, and in very exuberant ways. But, but what is the, what is a, kind of, what do you need to understand from surrealism to really grasp Shakespeare mm -hmm. and some of what you've gotten into? I, my answer to that, Mike, is very simple. It, it's, it's take it for real, mm. right? Just, just, just allow it. What, what, what is given to you, allow. And, and um, don't construct sort of hierarchies of presence. You know, there's, 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 there's the hierarchies of presence are what they are. By that, I mean, if something is, if something is here, then, then allow its presence mm. and pay attention to that presence and you know, look, look, look either side of, look around the corner of that presence, rather than have these preempting categories which are endlessly ordering everything, mm -hmm. and rationalizing everything, and neutering and euphemizing, and that's what you know most of us do all the time. That, that and so is, and I think that the, the surrealism idea is the same thing. I mean, I, I, I think that you know the idea that where you you know you you have it's the way children, for example, will look at a painting of, I don't know, Dali or something and, and see whatever it is, a bent instrument and a bowl of milk. I just, I'm, you know, and they'll see a bent instrument and a bowl of milk and, they, and it, it won't be some, they won't sort of translate that into some kind of secondary revision thing. They'll just see that as a, as, as, as a, as a, as a, as a, a present kind of um, fact, I don't know if factive is a word, but you know, that, there it is, this is it. And they'll think about how that, how, where's that come from? You know, as simple as that. And I think, I always say to my students that just just take it for real. Just don't don't, don't kind of don't sort of translate what, what what's given into some kind of anterior yeah. form. That's yeah. what I would say. Don't don't disqualify your curiosity. Yeah. No, I, yeah, I, I completely agree with that. In fact, and and I yeah, I mean, what one example of it just is we 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 touched on it, but but when Ross talked about good men's lives dying. Um, before the flower, expiring before the flowers in their their caps, and then you get that extra apparent redundancy: dying or ere they sicken. And it's a what Simon's saying is that you, you know that there you you don't just say okay, it's a kind of it's a recursive circumlocution, and it's just it's the doubleness, and then that, that the weirdness, and the fact that the mind can the mind stutters. You know, they're already dead. They're already dead, and then you revisit that death, which precedes the sickness. Um, but you've I, the only thing I'd add to it is I think you've got to which which I know Simon does in his teaching and is doing Shakespeare, but but you've got to um, you've got to give them permission and confidence. Really, you've got to you've got to because because to, to retreat to, to to common knowledge is is a natural thing. You know, especially in the face of the prestige of Shakespeare. You've got to say, let's just slow it down and really trace it through. What are you seeing there? And are you seeing the, the, the spoon belt bent in milk? Or, and once you, you, you open, once you permit that innocent curiosity, curiosity, then you're in the creative space. That, that is, that's your on that you, you were, you were talking about. And I, it is, it is written throughout Shakespeare. And it is that defiance of, I mean, I've been thinking about, about a, you know the French objections to Shakespeare. That, that, that precisely that surrealism, drunkenness, untidiness, kind of overdetermined um, quality. And I mean, the other thing that I suppose comes 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 to mind is high, and we did talk about this, but we, we're not young enough. You know, high, high, hypertext and the internet and all these sorts of things. I mean, there may well be ways of super forms of superimposition. There are new forms, presumably available all over the place because of new technology. <laughs> And well, I, when the massive meme stream about Macbeth, uh, which may already exist, right, it comes yeah. out. Where, yeah. You know, he was an astonishingly creative person living at a time of massive change. Yeah. And, and that recipe for who that guy was rarely gets, is the start to the conversation. But I yeah. think it's, it's relevant and you're, there's a seriousness of motive behind mm -hmm. your criticism and your fiction that is trying to um, you know, do justice to that strange fact. <laughs> and we're looking for this, we're looking for those people today. We need them now. <laughs> we need them right now. <laughs> um, it's one, it's 25 after the hour, but we're almost going to say goodbye. I wondered if, if you have some final thoughts to share with those who've joined the call or are joining later after this discussion. 
Oh my God. My <laughs> thoughts are, um, you know, buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> I will. No, buy the book. Well, no, I think, yeah, then the Macbeth and Macbeth. I, I think we just carrying to what we said. I mean, I think that the 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 Shakespeare has has got a very very unusual um, forget just forgetting about us for a minute and just talking about Shakespeare for a second. I think Shakespeare's got a very very unusual, um, obviously unusual prestige, but unusual quality of being it's sort of very you know in some ways very very difficult and um, can be very hard to understand, very off putting. At the same time as the, as the most lasting and most popular dramatist, and it's that's that's a, a kind of very strange paradox. And I think what I always, what I really think about Shakespeare is that there's I, I I really don't think we should get in the way. And I and I think I think people can, and I and I think that the simplest thing with Shakespeare is just to let the words, as it were, mean what they say, and recognize that Shakespeare's difficulty, his density, his his metaphors, and piling one on top of the other. They're always rooted in stuff that we all know and all do. They're rooted in the body, in, in not necessarily one's own body, but the body of a cow um, or the body of a piece of, of a grain or a granary, as in, as in Othello or something. They're rooted in, 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 in physical actions, in, in, in sweating and farming and, and lovemaking and eating and so forth. And these are things which anybody might get access to. It doesn't require tremendous kind of etymological knowledge or abstract now it doesn't require any of that you can just kind of allow and just the the and and so it's not about it's not about you sort of generalizing the meaning into something you think you already know but rather to discover the newness in what you actually have already experienced without necessarily recognizing it and i think that's an enormously democratizing and inclusive and permissive thing and i think that that's a secret to enjoying the stuff but also to to enjoying reading it, but also to enjoying teaching it, which is a killer. So many teachers are frightened by Shakespeare, and they don't need to be. Um, and you know, it's 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 just there, waiting. <laughs> and, and and you know, it just just you know, that's what I think. And I think our book was written in that spirit, in the re forgetting all the large the large claims or whatever the huge ambitions or the iconic classism. It was really just saying, so what is how can we get to the sort of truth of this as we experience it? You know, that's the, as we recognize it. Yeah. yeah. No, it, yeah, I love all that. I, I, I think it, I, I think it's right. And I, I, I think it is that sense of Shakespeare is a kind of script for, as a script for living and the possibilities of, 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 of living. Um, but I, the only other thing I'd add to what we've been been saying, I mean, that the neg the negativism is there, the horror is there, it is there in Macbeth. But we were also really haunted by the, the the cherishing positivity of the play, the fact that Macbeth, in his murderousness, speaks the most yearningly beautiful speech about sleep, that most creaturely and innocent thing that's ever been that's ever been written. Um, so I I wouldn't wish to give the impression to anyone who hasn't read it that we we said we, <laughs> may this made boomerang as a judgment on us but um i think we see it as in some ways a cherishing fiction as that in 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 the um storm of the, the, the of, of of terror and horror there is love and there's a desperate attempt to find and to 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 recover and rediscover and and a desire to build and and, and begin again so that that's 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 what I'd end with. Uh, optimism in the middle of a downpour. <laughs> it's, it's a very interesting combination that you both bring. Uh, and I'm very grateful for being able to speak with you today, to hear you talk about what's behind this fiction, what's ahead of it. And I want to thank everyone who's joining us for this conversation. Uh, the yeah. book is available. And I'm assuming that a link is below this conversation. Thanks everyone who came. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Ewan. And um, Thanks, Mike. look forward to hearing more. Thank you very much, Mike. Thank you, of thank you. Thank you.